right, I want to welcome all of our campuses to the second week of our series entitled, Is This the End? Come on, can we just welcome all those that are joining us? Man, we're excited to have you guys. So we are jumping into the second week of a seven-part series studying the book of Revelation. Now, I want to say this to all of you. Maybe, maybe you're new in Christianity, or maybe you're checking it out. The Bible is divided into two parts, the Old and the New Testament. The book of Revelation is actually the last book of the Bible. Like I said last week, the Bible, the book of Revelation, was actually written by John, John the Apostle. He was on the Greek Isle of Patmos, and it was there the Lord appeared to John and began to speak to John about things that were, things that had happened, things that were currently happening, and things that were going to happen. You know, it's interesting. The Bible really speaks specifically about not only the present, but also the future, end times. Everybody say end times. Matter, matter of fact, speaking of the end times, it's interesting. I, uh, I did hear something funny this week about a man who <clears throat> went in for his annual checkup, and, and he received a phone call from his physician a couple of days later. The doctor said, I'm afraid I've actually got some bad news for you. He said, well, what's that, doc? He said, well, after the checkup, I, I realized, you know, we did all of our analysis, and, and the truth is, sir, I, I apologize, but you've, you've got like 48 hours left on the earth to live. The guy goes, that is terrible. It's very bad news. The doctor says, well, time out. Actually, I've actually got some worse news than that. He said, how can you have worse news than that? I mean... You're calling me to tell me that I've only got 48 hours to live. That's, how can anything be worse than that? The doctor kind of interrupts and says, quite honestly, sir, I've been trying to reach you for the last 24 hours to give you this message. <clears throat> Everybody say end times. Now, it's funny. People have asked me this before. They say, you know, pastor, do you believe that we're living in the end times? And I'll say this. I actually do believe we're living in the end times. But regardless of whether or not Jesus is coming back in five years, 50 years, or 500 years, I say this respectfully, it's your end times. In, in other words, you and I don't get another shot. We, we don't believe as Bible-believing Christians, we don't believe in reincarnation. It's kind of like, yeah, you went the first time, it's kind of mean to some people, didn't help poor people, boom, you're coming back as a roach. <laughs> we, we don't believe that. The Bible is clear in the book of Hebrews, it is appointed unto man once. Everybody say once. Once to die, then the judgment. So the reality is all of us, this is our last generation that we're here on the earth. The fact of the matter is it's going quicker than I actually anticipated. How many of y'all remember? Matter of fact, I remember when I played Dixie Youth Baseball. I was 12 years old. And I remember talking to my friend. I can distinctly remember this in my memory bank. I can remember saying to my friend, when we found out that our coach was 40. I remember thinking to myself, that's an old dude. <laughs> How many of y'all would say that that's not an old dude today? Come on, you know, that's like a young dude. So young people, let me just tell you something. It happens quicker than you realize. Everybody say end times. So we're studying the book of Revelation. We're going to get into some interesting things today, and then over the next five weeks. I do want to say, I know it's football season. I know there's LSU, Tulane. I know there's Saints. I know all our campuses. There's all different Southern, all different people are in and out. Let me just say this. If you miss a message, please go back, watch what's called On Demand. You can watch it on Facebook or on our internet, because it's important. Each one of the messages build each week. You can download the app, the Church of the King app. You've got all the notes, all my maps, all my graphs there. All right, let's jump into the message today. Our culture continues to shift. We actually are living in what I would call a seismic shift in our culture, moving further away from what I would consider biblical values, Judeo-Christian values, specifically in the Western world. Uh, it's very radical shifts that are taking place. And whenever there is a shift in an environment, in a culture, uh, there's always this unique set of pressure that takes place. If you're a college student, you're living in the security of your home, you move up, now you're in a dorm room or you're away from home. And that, that's, by the way, that's a culture shift. 
Maybe you're exposed to things in a college atmosphere that you weren't exposed to, maybe growing up in a Christian home. And, and now all of a sudden, you've got choices to make, right? Because now you're in this, this different environment, and it's, it's shifting around you. And there's unique pressures. By the way, there's unique pressures when the culture shifts around you. Maybe you've gotten this new job, and, and, and you're wanting to be a faithful believer in Jesus and have a faithful marriage. And now after work, there's tremendous pressure for you to go with the people after work to do things that does not honor your marriage. It doesn't honor your, your commitment to Christ. And, and it's almost like you're frowned upon. It's like, what, what are you talking about? You, you, you won't go with us to do that? What, what do you mean? And there's pressure. Everybody say pressure. Pressure is unique. The reality is pressure. What is pressure? It constricts movement. It constricts flow. In other words, pressure, pressure causes whatever's on the inside of you to come out when it comes. It's kind of like a toothpaste, right? You squeeze a toothpaste. Watch this. That's pressure. And toothpaste comes out. Wow. The reality is, is that we currently... In the Western world, but really globally speaking, we're experiencing pressure. We used to, and I said this last week, we used to get extra credit in our nation if you say you're a Christian. And really the Western world, not today. I mean, the reality is, is there's persecution. By the way, there was persecution in the first century church. There was persecution for being a faithful Christian follower of Jesus in the second century, third century, and even today. Globally speaking, Christians are drastically being persecuted for their faith. We don't understand that often in the Western world. I looked up this week, you can actually go to this, this website, the study of global Christianity. It's out of the UK, United Kingdom. And last year alone, 90,000 people were martyred for their faith in Jesus Christ. Listen, the most persecuted nations on the earth persecuting Christians Afghanistan, North Korea, Somalia, Libya, and Yemen. That is the exact condition 2,000 years ago that John writes to when he writes to the seven churches in Asia. Today we're going to talk to you about how do you deal in pressure. How do you navigate pressure? The same way that these seven churches, I'm going to ask you to go ahead and pull up that map. This will help you guys. Jesus appears to John. <clears throat> John is on the Isle of Patmos. Patmos is a Greek island. <clears throat> if you look at contemporary maps, you'll see today. This is Greece, the mainland. It's really interesting. And you've got all of these Greek islands out here. It was true in biblical times, and it's true today. John was exiled onto the Isle of Patmos for preaching the gospel. In essence, it was a penal colony, right? So that's where he is. Revelation chapter 1, Jesus appears to John. And he begins to speak to John and give John a message, all right? Revelation chapter 1, by the way, Revelation chapter 1 verse 19 gives a great delineation of the book of Revelation. Here it is. Revelation chapter 1, Jesus speaks to John about things that were in the past. Revelation chapter 2 and 3, by the way, we're going to deal with that today. Jesus speaks to John to the churches at Asia as it was currently happening. Revelation chapter 4 through 22, by the way, we'll begin that next week. That's things to come. What was, what is, what is to come. Chapter 1, what it was. Chapter 2 and 3 today, what is. Chapter 4 to 22. That's when we're going to get into the tribulation. The Christians go through the tribulation. What about the Antichrist? Pastor Steve, do you believe the Antichrist is living today? And where does the Antichrist come from? And what about the millennial reign of Christ? Is that like a thousand year, literal thousand year? Is it figurative? We're going to get all of that. All of that. Is Revelation chapter 4 to 22. And I'll do that for five weeks. Five weeks starting next week. You don't want to miss next week. Today. Today we're talking about that middle section, chapter 2 and chapter 3. Where Jesus, watch this. It's not John mes John's message to the seven churches. It's Jesus' message 
Not to John, but through John to these seven churches. And by the way, it wasn't just to that first century church. This is Turkey. We would call this modern day Turkey. In Bible times, it was called Asia what? Minor. All right? Modern day Turkey, modern day Greece. He's on the Isle of Patmos. That's where John is. This is around 89, 90 AD, about 60 years after the death of Christ. John is an older apostle at that time. And Jesus appears to him. In chapter 2 and 3 today, we're talking about Jesus has a message for these seven churches. And by the way, not just for them, but those seven messages apply to us today. Specifically, they were being persecuted and they were experiencing pressure. Everybody say pressure. How do you respond to pressure today as a Christian? How do you respond? How did they respond to pressure? How do we respond? That's why we can learn from them. All right. There's four different responses that seven churches. The reason why there's not seven responses is because two churches respond a certain way, a similar way, and another two. So actually there are four responses, seven churches, because I couple a couple churches. You'll see this in just a moment. All right. You guys ready to step into this? Yes. Sounds like about five of y'all. I'm going to just ask one more time. This is strictly for my self-esteem. Are y'all ready to dive into this? All right, I'm just asking. just want to make sure that I'm preaching to the right people, all right? All right, here we go. Revelation chapter 2. The first response to pressure, and I want to call it the passion test. Revelation chapter 2 Let's read what Jesus says to the first church, the church at Ephesus. Revelation chapter 2, verse 2 and 3. Here's what he says. John, listen, Jesus speaks to John. John, tell the church at Ephesus this. This is what I want to tell them. This is our Lord speaking. I know your works, your labor, your patience that you cannot bear those who are evil. And you've tested those who say they're apostles and are not. And you have found them liars. Whoa. And you've persevered and you've had patience and you've labored for my name's sake and you've not become weary. You've gone to church. I want to commend you for that. Jesus begins his address of the church of Ephesus. It is a church It was a real historical church in a city called Ephesus, modern-day Turkey, Bible times Asia Minor, port city. He commends them, and then he corrects them. Look at verse 4. Nevertheless, I have this against you, that you have left your first love. Can you pull that map up again for me? Jesus Chapter 2 speaks to John. John, tell the church at Ephesus there. Remember, this is the imperial empire. This is the Roman Empire. Modern day Turkey, Bible times called Asia Minor, geographically. But it's all under the control of Rome. You have to understand that. The Roman emperor at the time called Domitian. Very wicked. And it was was Roman, it was Roman. Kingdom-wide, let me say empire-wide persecution of believers. And John says this. Jesus says to John, John, tell him this. You've been faithful to go to church, and I want to commend you. You've done some Christian deeds. I want to commend you for that. But you've lost your passion for Christ. You've left your first love. Ephesus was one of the four big imperial cities in the Roman Empire. Rome, of course, being the biggest. Antioch. We hear a lot about Antioch in the book of Acts. Alexandria in Ephesus. Wealthy city, port city. And Jesus has a message for them. You guys have been blessed. You've grown. You've expanded. You've built buildings. It's amazing. Great job. Kudos. But you've lost your passion for me. Question, Pastor Steve, why why does a Christian 
It's walk with Jesus maybe for years. Why do they lose their passion? I mean, they're still showing up. They're still going through the motions, but they've lost that vibrancy, that passion. I think there's lots of reasons. Sometimes it's because you've not managed disappointment well, which is a part of life. We go through disappointment, which if you don't deal with disappointment well, it can become discouragement. If we don't then deal with that, it can become despondency. A life event, something doesn't happen, a relationship doesn't turn out, something doesn't turn out with a kid right, a business situation. You stepped out, you had faith in your heart. I mean, whatever it is, right? You got disappointed in a relationship, you got disappointed in people, and you've grown cynical. And when you grow cynical because of pain of life, you, there's, a, there's a jadedness that comes into your soul. And what happens is, is it can, here's what I found, is that when your mind gets cynical, it steals passion out of your heart. Times in my life where, matter of fact, there's been a couple seasons in my life where I was still going through the motions. I, I talk about my story in 2010. Matter of fact, I was a pastor. By the way, remember this. Every pastor, before they're a pastor, they're first a Christian. Or they at least should be. Isn't that right? There's times in my life where I felt like I was going through the motions. I remember one day, and I was, I was kind of burned out, a lot of things, and a and lot of reasons why, and and I was still doing my professional duties, but I've lo I lost my passion for Christ. That first love, it's kind of like this. You, you remember when you, when you first fell in love, right, with, with your, maybe your wife today or, or your husband today, and, and they were boyfriend, girlfriend, and, and there was a fire, and there was a passion. By the way, same thing in a marriage is true in your relationship with God. You've got to kindle your relationship. Now, here's what I love about God. And here's what I love about God's Word. Everybody say the word test. The beautiful words that every college student can hear from their professor is, I'm going to give you a makeup test. How many of y'all are grateful that God gives us makeup tests? Come on. Are y'all grateful for that? Here's God's makeup test. You failed the test. You lost your passion. But verse 5 says this, remember, therefore, from where you have fallen, repent. You were on the interstate. You took an off-ramp. Here's the good news. You can take an on-ramp. Everybody say repent. repent. Repent and do the first works. I, I, that word repentance, it's not used in church much today. I don't, I don't know why. Maybe it brings up all kind of caricatures in your mind. You know, if somebody holding up a sign, screaming, they got veins coming out of their neck, preaching about hell like they've been there themselves. Come on, you know what I'm talking about. And, and I, you, may, maybe that's why you've walked away. But it's a biblical term. And let me tell you what repentance means. It's metanoema or noia. And, and, and here's what it means. Meta means change, shift. And N-O-I-A means the mind. To repent means you shift your mind. You shift your direction. In other words, if you're going one way, here's repentance. You guys ready? By the way, biblical repentance is not just I'm sorry. You're in a relationship with your spouse, right? You go, I'm just sorry. Well, that's great. That's like the first step. The next step is change. Here's biblical repentance. You guys ready? Here it is. Here it is. Biblical repentance. All right? You're going this way. All right? Meta noai or noema. Here it is. Here it is. Here it is. You're going this way. Oh, I've lost my passion for God. I'm going to turn and I'm going to pursue God afresh. By the way, repentance is not 360. Here's why. Because if you're going this way, if you do a 360, you're still in the same spot. We don't want that. Everybody say change. It's change. He said repent. Just get back on track. Don't go gravel down in the dirt and beat yourself up and self-flagellate. You don't pay for your sins. I did on the cross, Jesus would say. But come to me, come to me, repent, repent, turn. So if you pull my map up, the very first message that Jesus has, watch this, through John, John, tell the church at Ephesus, they were churchgoers, but they lost their passion. Question, are you a churchgoer, but you've lost your passion? It's great that you're showing up in church. Praise God. You need to. But don't lose the passion. Don't let disappointment turn into discouragement and despondency and become cynical. Watch this. You can regain the fire. The second 
test, I think, that we see here with the seven churches is not just a passion test, but it's what I would call a purity test. The churches of Pergamon and Thyatira took the purity test and they failed. They both had good deeds, but they had poor doctrine and even a poor lifestyle. These churches were both in the most pluralistic of societies. I'm going to talk about that in a little bit. Pluralism simply means a multitude of faiths around you. And it, they allowed it to corrupt their faith. They allowed it to come into their belief system, though. So the first message is to John, to the church at Ephesus. Passion test. Second, purity test. It's two churches. It's Pergamon and Thyatira. If you pull that up, now it's Jesus to John. John, tell the church at Pergamon. It's not just the city. It's the church in the city of Pergamon. And, and, and also, not just Pergamon. I want you to tell Thyatira because they're really dealing with the same thing. They're dealing with an encroachment. I'm going to talk about it in just a moment. All right? And it was an issue of their purity. Pergamon had multiple temples and altars and shrines for the gods that they worshipped. The most prominent actual religion in Pergamon was emperor worship. They worshipped Caesar, right? The Caesar was the Roman leader. And they, they, you see that in the book of Revelation. By the way, Caesar, all through the book of Re Revelation, is actually an antichrist figure. There is an antichrist, singular, but there have been antichrists, plural, throughout history. Caesar would be considered, the Bible talks about it, an antichrist. And, and there was what would be called emperor worship. Jesus speaks to John and said, John, I want to deal with this. Their doctrine has been corrupted and their, and their, and their sexual ethic has been corrupted. Watch this. Revelation chapter 2, it was in the church. Revelation chapter 2, verse 13. Watch this. He says to the church at Pergamon, I know your works and where you dwell, and I know where Satan's throne is. That was Caesar, by the way. It was a, it was a, it was a comment related to these antichrist figures throughout Scripture. This is going to get real interesting. You do not want to miss next week. And I know where Satan's throne is, and you hold fast to my name, and you did not deny my faith. You still went to church. And even in the days of Antipas, who was a faithful martyr, who was killed among you where Satan dwells, Pergamon, that was that figure, that Antichrist figure. But I have a few things against you because you have, and, and because you have there those who hold to the doctrine of Balaam and who talk Balak to put a stumbling block before the children of Israel. Now, let me pause here just for a moment. I don't have time to unpack that, but Jesus, remember, these are not John's words. These are Jesus' message to these churches through John. Not to John, through John. And he said, number one, I've got a problem because you've compromised your doctrine. Doctrine's not a bad word. Doctrine's a good word. Doctrine is actually from the Latin word didache, which means teaching. Healthy, good Churches should have good doctrine of who Christ is. Soteriology, not only Christology, but soteriology, how one gets saved. We're not saved by our good works, but we're saved by our faith in Christ. It's the, it's the life, death, burial, and resurrection of Christ. We have to have good doctrine, pneumatology, the study of the Holy Spirit, eschatology, eschaton, the study of last things. Good, healthy churches should have good doctrine. Good Bible teaching. By the way, here's what I found. When churches have corrupted doctrine, it's not too quickly thereafter that they also have corrupted morals. Your morals follow your doctrine. Albeit good or bad. Look at this case. Who taught Balak to put a stumbling block before the children of Israel and to eat things sacrificed to idols and to commit sexual immorality. They've allowed it in the church. Bad teaching in the church, bad doctrine in the church, idolatry in the church, and sexual immorality in the church. Pergamon took great pride in being the center of imperial worship. The worship centered around trade guilds, what we would call unions. They would have 
kind of the emperor's guys would come out and, and, and they would encourage the people and they would have temple prostitutes. That, that they, would, they would have these drunken orgies and they would have sex with these temple prostitutes, both male and female. And by the way, the Christian churches, the Christian people that did not want to participate in this, guess what they were actually called? They were actually called haters. Haters of the God, haters of the citizens of Rome, and haters of Caesar. Isn't that interesting? So the Christians were being persecuted because they held to a different sexual ethic. Such extreme pressure was a test of their purity. Some remained faithful, and Jesus commended them for that. And some gave in to the culture. They asked questions then. The same way that people are asking questions now, such as, does God really say that these activities are wrong? Seems like everybody's doing it. Everybody's doing it. After work, everybody's doing it. At the campus, everybody's doing it. In our neighborhood, it seems like everybody's doing it. It can't be wrong, right? Because after all, I mean, popular opinion rules the day, right? If everybody's doing it. Here's another one. Is there a way that I can just be accepted by both groups? We want to talk about the love of God and let's help the poor, but let's just not worry about lifestyle and sexual ethics. It doesn't really matter, does it? As long as you're helping people, does it really matter? How do you live? Does it really matter? I mean, I know the Bible kind of talks about it, but isn't that a little bit? Maybe, maybe those parts are somewhat antiquated. Maybe that's it. Maybe it doesn't fit because after all, you know, this was written like 2,000 years ago and, and this was like before the internet. And we're advanced now. Be careful. Does anyone really know what's right and what is wrong? Amidst this persecution, teachings cropped up, which seemed to allow people to be followers of Jesus, and yet partakers of these immoral celebrations. And Jesus had a message to them. Yeah. Just as the church at Pergamon was engaging in emperor worship and the sexual immorality it was in the church, same with Thyatira. Look at Revelation chapter 2, verse 20. Jesus said, nevertheless, I have a few things against you because you allow that woman Jezebel who calls herself a prophetess to teach and seduce my servants, to commit sexual immorality, and to eat things sacrificed to idols. It was idolatry, it was bad teaching, bad doctrine, and sexual immorality. I gave her time to repent of her sexual immorality. God always gives us time to repent, and she did not repent. As followers of Jesus, we must hold to truth. I want everyone to hear me, every one of our locations. We must hold the truth, and we must hold to the purity of God's word, and, and we must not compromise with that. I, I, there's the encroachment of culture around us. By the way, culture's making it up every day. You realize that. Every day, everything's changing. What was right then is now wrong, and just hang on. You know, it's gonna. What was right? What's wrong now? It's right. And why? Because they're making it up. I, I I know that every time a pastor talks about sexuality or sexual ethic or what the Bible teaches about it, people get nervous. Why? And 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 I'm gonna tell you. Part of the reason is in the '60s and '70s, there was sexual revolution in culture. The problem is, is it creeped into the church. And pastors are scared. And I say this in the fear of the Lord. I was sexually immoral before I came to Christ. So I say this with brokenness in my, in my voice and a heart of compassion towards people. There's so much sexual brokenness in our culture and confusion, by the way. So much confusion. And yet, the Bible is clear. God gives us parameters not to restrict our fun, but to maximize us, to maximize pleasure in the context of how he says it can happen. And, 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 and is there even a word for immorality in our culture? Is, does fornication even mean anything in our culture anymore? Does, 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 does that even mean anything to anybody anymore? And yet the Bible talks about it. What? It's any sexual activity outside of the context of covenant marriage between a man and a woman. The Bible says any sexual activity outside of that. The, the Bible calls that fornication. The, the Bible does. Now here's the good news. You can be forgiven. And you can be transformed. And you can be cleaned by the power of Christ. I know what it's like to live with the guilt with sexual sin. I know what it's like. I, 
I know what it's like to live under that. And, and so what culture says is, well, the way to get away from guilt is just hide the Bible. The reason why, the reason why we feel guilty is because of all those Christians. And if we'll just burn Bibles and hide Bibles and restrict speech and, and you don't talk. The problem is you can, you, you can burn every Bible in the world and you can run from every Christian preacher, but you can't run from your conscience. And your conscience, you're made in the image of God. And you have a moral compass. And you have to press deep down within. You know God created you. And God doesn't want you living enslaved. God, doesn't, God wants you free. Everybody say free. And so churches make decisions. And some churches today, sadly enough, they've adopted the cultural sexual ethic. And because they don't want to be called a hater. They don't want to be called mean. And, and, yet, and yet, all the while, enslaving people in sexual sin. Where the preacher should, with a broken heart and a broken voice, should be able to say, you don't have to live enslaved to that. You can live free in God. Jesus had a message to them. He had a message to them. They allowed, the first group allowed works to steal passion. This group allowed bad doctrine, idolatry, and and they allowed that. And and I want to say this, I know every time a pastor talks about this, I know there's, listen, I say it in the fear of the Lord, and I say this, I love you guys, I love every one of you, even though I don't know everybody at all of our locations, but as your pastor, I'm going to tell you the truth, sexual immorality will enslave your soul. You can be set free by the power of God and enjoy sexual intimacy with your spouse in the context of marriage, and it's wonderful pleasure if we do it God's way. Let's not get smarter than God. Can I have a big amen? Let's not get smarter than God. Thank God for God's mercy and his grace to help us and give us another chance. Verse 22, unless they repent, we can repent. Maybe you've gotten off the interstate. You get back on. Took an off-ramp. You get an on-ramp. There's still time. Three is the purpose test. One is the passion test. Church at Ephesus, if you'll pull my graph up. Jesus had a message to John to tell the church at Ephesus, you're going through the motions, but you lost your passion. You can get it back. Jesus had a message through John to the church at Pergamon. He had a message. He had a message to that church. He had a message to the church at Pergamon in Thyatira. He had a message to them that they can repent and live holy before God and be empowered to do life God's way. Now, now is the purpose, the purpose test. To the church at Sardis and Laodicea. It's the purpose test. This is, this is fascinating. You, this is fascinating, this message that he gives. So Jesus gives a message to John, now to the church at Sardis and Laodicea. It's a purpose issue. The cities of Sardis and Laodicea were similar in several respects. Both enjoyed great wealth. Both had water springs within the city. Sardis literally bubbled up with gold dust. Crazy. This is crazy. Ancient Greek mythology stated that Midas sprinkled the city's fountains with gold dust. Does that sound familiar? Midas touch? Regardless of whatever Greek mythology said, it had a fountain in the city. But not only did Sardis have a fountain, but also watch this, Laodicea. Please don't miss this. There was a spring. By the way, I read this morning, interestingly, I, I read in NOLA.com. Did anybody see that article about Hot Springs, Arkansas? Did, y'all, did anybody see that? Good. Y'all don't read the paper. You should. But anyway, so. But watch this. It's interesting. Laodicea actually had a hot spring, but it wasn't drinkable water. In the hot spring actually had minerals. And people would travel thousands, they would travel miles away, watch this, and they would come to the hot spring and bathe in the hot spring, and it brought healing to their body. The problem was, you couldn't drink the water, and they didn't have any clean water to drink. So, they actually imported a giant aquifer, like a holding tank, from a nearby region, And they were able to capture water and actually even bring in water so that all the people, because this was a source of commerce for them. They needed the guests to have something to drink. So now the guests would come to the hot water and bathe in it and get healing for their body. And they could have cool, clean water to drink to satiate their body. Powerful. And Jesus had a message for this church. This church also had what was called syncretism. 
They allowed syncretism. The first church allowed works to replace passion. The second two churches allowed bad doctrine, idolatry, and sexual immorality to replace purity. This church, this church had lost their purpose because they allowed their belief system be, to be diluted by other beliefs around them. You, you hear it today. We see it today. Syncretism. Even in some Christian church, I say that respectfully in the fear of the Lord. A little bit of Buddhism, a little bit of Islam, a little bit of Christianity, kind of mix it up. And after all, pastor, isn't the whole goal, I mean, if you really boil down all religions at the end of the day, aren't they all about kind of the main thing of just trying to be a good person and help people? I want to say this as strong as I can. Christianity is absolutely diametrically opposed to Every other world religion. And here's why. You can't mix it. And here's why. Every world religion, Buddhism, Islam, Hinduism, everyone is what we have to do. Watch this. What works we have to do to be right with God. It's called man's effort. Biblical Christianity is what God did for us in Christ on the cross. Listen, for us. It's not what we do, listen, for God, to be acceptable to God. It's what God did for us in the death and resurrection of Christ. For us, that's called grace. You can't mix it together. That's happening in churches. They make a little New Age movement, a little Christianity, because we just want, because isn't the goal about being a good person and helping people? Yes, we ought to help people, but that's not the goal. The goal is to know Christ and Him crucified. And out of doing that, we help people. The goal is to know Christ. Have a relationship with God, our creator. And this church allowed syncretism to come in. Dilution to come in. And because of that, they lost their purpose. Jesus said, Revelation 3, 1, I know your works, that you have a name, and that you're alive. But the truth is, you're really dead. You're dead. What do you mean you're dead? Look at verse 16. Because you're lukewarm. This is going to help you guys. Some of you guys have read this verse before. I thought, I don't really get it. It's going to help you right here. You're going to get it. Because you're lukewarm in the middle, and you're neither, watch this, cold nor hot. I'm going to vomit you out of my mouth. Why is that? The hot, listen, you were not, you're, what the backdrop is they understood exactly what he was talking about in that culture. You're not hot. You can't heal the body, and you're not cold to drink. You can't satisfy the body. In other words, you, you're, you're warm. That means some of the minerals got in the drinking water, it makes you sick, and some of the drinking water got in the mineral waters, which it reduces the impact to heal the body. In other words, you've lost your effectiveness. And when we compromise, that's called a hokey pokey Christian. Yeah, you know, I just want to relate to culture. I just want to relate to culture. I just like I don't want to like be too radical about this thing. Like I, my relationship with God is like personal. It's private. Like nobody knows that I'm a Christian. Nobody would ever know that. And I, because I want to relate to my friends, you know, I want to get loaded with my friends because I'm being a witness. And I want to just because I'm being a witness, because I'm better when I'm super drunk when I talk about Jesus because it just makes more sense. And I just, I just, I want to be a witness. I want to be relevant. I want to be relevant. No, you've lost your effectiveness. What's different between you? You're living in the same lifestyle. You're doing the same sexual things. You're getting drunk. You're getting messed up. You know, what's the, what? I can't wait to have that life. You've lost your effectiveness. It's happening all over the place. All over the place. Let me tell you something. When you're a Christian, you're taking out of the world. Listen, you're in it, but you're not of it. You're not of it. By the way, by the way, by the way, when you're filled with the Holy Spirit, first word, holy. And that's not about your hair color. It's about your heart. And it's about do you live for God and do you believe in biblical values? <laughs> Lose your effectiveness for God. I went through this at Tulane University. I go through it today. I had a friend of mine recently go, Steve, like, I, I hadn't seen him in years. He goes, are you still like into the Jesus thing? <laughs> Let's dissect that. Am I still into the Jesus? This is not a philosophy, an ideology, a belief system. <laughs> I had an encounter with the living Christ. I was transformed. Are you kidding me? I was changed by Jesus. This is not like 
You put your right foot in, you take your right foot out. Here's the good news. Therefore, be zealous and repent. You get back on track. You get back on track. I'll give you this last one and we'll close. The faith test. Everybody say passion test. That was to Ephesus. All right. Number two, the purity test. Everybody say purity test. The purity test. The purity test. Number three is the purpose test. Everybody say purpose test. All right. Here's the last one. The faith test and we'll close. Smyrna and Philadelphia. It's the only two. They only get common, they get affirmed. Accolades. Smyrna and Philadelphia. Passion, you lost your passion. You're showing up, but you lost your passion. Keep your fire. Two, you allow bad doctrine, idolatry, and sexual immorality to come into the church. And you don't, you don't call people out. You don't, you don't challenge people with truth. Yes in love, but truth. Truth. Guys, right here, you lost your purpose. You got lukewarm, you lost your purpose. You allowed syncretism to come in. Ah, ah, Philadelphia and Smyrna. Yeah. Cities of Smyrna and Philadelphia were not all that different from other cities. They enjoyed the wealth and the peace of Rome. They had a tremendous oversaturation of temples and altars and shrines. There's a lot of temptation. But they remain faithful to God. Pastor, is it, is it possible? Is it possible to remain faithful to God in our culture today? According to the Bible, it is. According to a lot of people I know, it is. You can stay faithful to God. Not perfect. God, by the way, God's not looking for perfection. He's looking for faithfulness. Watch this. Revelation chapter 2, verse 9. I know your works, your tribulation, your poverty. And I know, but you are rich, and I know the blasphemy of those who say they're Jews and are not, but are a synagogue and say, do not fear any of those things which you're about to suffer. Watch this. Be faithful. Everybody say, be faithful. Be faithful unto death, and I will give you the crown of life. Chapter 3, verse 12, last verse. He who overcomes, I will make him a pillar in the temple of my God, and he shall go out no more, and I will write on him the name of my God and the name of the city of my God, the new Jerusalem. We're going to talk about that the last week. Coming down from the heavens, Revelation chapter 20 and 21, very powerful, which comes down out of heaven from my God, and I will write on him my new name. What is John saying? I commend you. It's Jesus saying to Smyrna in Philadelphia, you've been faithful. You've been faithful. Stay faithful. Stay faithful. Stay faithful. Even when you're disappointed, stay faithful. Even when you're discouraged, stay faithful. Stay faithful to God. Stay faithful to God. Stay, fa stay faithful. Everybody say faithful. Doesn't mean perfect. Doesn't mean you don't ever make a mistake. But you're faithful to God. Your heart is stay faithful. Church, stay faithful to God. Faithful to God. Stay faithful to the word of God. Keep showing up. Stay faithful. I, I read some. Somebody sent me an article this week. And it was on a news station that they said that by the year 2070, there's going to be like no Christians left in America, which is not true. But the reality is, I don't care if there's, I don't care who serves God. I'm going to stay faithful to Jesus. And I say that respectfully. Listen to me closely. But Pastor, you don't know what's happened. I've gone through a divorce and I walked away. That's actually when you need God. When you go through divorce, you don't run away from God. You, go, you run to God. Something happened to a child, you don't run away from God. You run to God. Something happened in your business. You don't, in other words, stay, everybody say stay faithful. Amen. You know, as a pastor, it breaks my heart. People that I know, they've gotten saved in this church, and they've, they've walked away from God. I don't know where their relationship with God is. They're out doing the same things they did before they got saved. The same things. What, what is there to go back to? Don't allow the world to pull you back into its old ways. Don't do that. Stay faithful to God. You can do it. Stay faithful to Christ. Let me tell you something. Bring your pain to God. Don't let pain harden you. Let pain drive you to the cross. Let it drive you to Christ. Stay faithful to God. Stay faithful to the truth of God's word. Stay full of the Holy Spirit. Holy Spirit. Drink of the Spirit of God. Don't drink of the Spirit of the world. Man, as a pastor, my heart breaks. 
When I see people that are on fire for God, where are they? Where are they? I'd be okay if they went to another church. But some I know, they don't, even, they don't go anywhere. Well, yeah, Christianity, well, it's just a stay faithful. To you got hurt, you got disappointed, you got deluded, and you've walked away. Come back. Stay faithful to God. Well done. Thy good. And everybody say it. Faithful servant. Not perfect, not successful, not powerful. Just stay faithful. Just stay faithful. Stay faithful to Jesus. Stay faithful to the word of God. I don't care if all your girlfriends walk away. I don't care if all your friends walk away. Stay faithful to God. I don't care what happens. I don't care if they're all having affairs. Stay faithful to God. I don't care if they're all getting loaded. Stay faithful to God. Stay faithful to God. I got delivered from sin. I don't want to go back to that stuff. Oh, sure, there's temptation, but you don't have to go back to it. I know the smell of sin. I know the sting of sin. I know the pain of sin. And I'm grateful for the blood of Christ that washes me clean. Sin. I'm going to bow your head. Oh. We need God. Yeah. Ooh, we need God. We need God. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you for your presence. If you do not know Christ, you're not sure about your relationship with God, we'll pray for you right now. The Bible says, whoever calls upon the name of Jesus shall be saved. Do you know Christ? He's not mad at you, my friend. He came to save you and set you free to give you life. There's no life apart from God's life. There's no life. Mm -mm. Do you know Christ? You know that you know if you die today, you're ready to stand before God. We'll pray for you right now. The Bible says, whoever calls upon the name of Jesus shall be saved. Shall be saved. Yeah. Whoever calls upon that name. In just a moment, the count of three, I'm just going to ask for a show of hands. You say, Pastor, pray for me. I need Christ. I need the blood of Jesus to wash me to cleanse me and to make me new. If that's you, the count of three. I'm going to ask you to lift your hand up. Pastor, I need Jesus. One, two, three. Quickly hold your hand up high. All of our locations. God bless you, sir. God bless you, ma'am. God bless you all right there. God bless you, sir. God bless wow, you. what an amazing message. And listen, if you're out there right now and you are making that decision, if you are making the decision in this moment for the first time to give your life to Jesus, we just want to say congratulations. This is the best decision you will ever make. And right now, you have entered in to the family of God. And this journey is not meant to be walked alone. So if you made the decision today to follow Christ for the first time, let us know. We want to know. Click the link in the chat right now so we can talk with you, partner with you, give you all the resources you need to walk out this new life with Christ. And again, congratulations. Welcome to the family. Well, guys, that's all the time we have for today. But listen, make sure you're here next week as we continue this series, Is This the End? It's gonna be so powerful. And hey, listen, pray about, think about who you can invite to service. Maybe it's a friend, a family member, a coworker, whoever. Let them know, invite them to church online with you next week. They don't wanna miss it because it's gonna be so, so good. But hey, that's all the time we have. So we'll see you guys here, same time. Same place.